Hey everyone, so today we're going to talk about a topic that some people have asked me to talk about before and it's around pairing and matrix strategy and just kind of my thoughts on the whole pairing system and, and how to go about it. Um, obviously, you know, most of my tournaments online have been team tournaments and I'm typically the, we'll say, captain. But typically I do all the hard work of spreadsheets and doing the actual pairings and stuff like that. So I thought it might be interesting to kind of show my view on, on how I think pairing should be or, or I don't know, just general thoughts around it. So, you know, if I go into a, an event, this is typically the type of sheet that I'll set up for my team. Um, we have our armies down here, whatever the enemy armies is. We might say the scenario up here or I put it here or, you know, here's our players. Here's our armies here, what they're playing. Here's the maps. Uh, after the fact, we can put in the scores, times. Enemy, enemy armies over here. And then and obviously the focus is not really about bookkeeping. It's about, you know, how I think you should fill out a matrix. And then honestly, how I, how I feel about pairing strategy in general. And maybe there are some pairing strategies that I like or don't like and, and things I talk to other players about and things I've seen. Um, and I think the first big thing to kind of I want to get out of the way when it comes to matrices and pairing strategies is I don't think pairing strategy matters as much as people think it matters. Um, and I think you can pair for yourself not to lose. It's very difficult to pair for yourself to win. Like this whole idea that you win in pairings to me is a little whatever. Um, a big reason is, is, let's say you see our matrix right here, right? Whatever, this, this was a couple tournaments ago. This doesn't mean shit, really, right? Because we might end up, go through this and do the pairings and say, oh, wow, we have two greens and two yellows and, a, and an orange or whatever system you want to use. That means we have the advantage. Does it really mean that? Because if you, a lot of the time when you get the enemy matrix, they think they got the advantage. And so, so somebody's wrong, right? Or you're both wrong and it's really not an, an advantage to anybody. It's just a match. So I, I think the biggest thing is before you can even go into pairing strategy and who to drop first and blah, blah, blah. If you can't rate a matchup correctly, it doesn't matter, right? If, if somebody says this matchup's green for me and they get the matchup and they blow it and, and, and we can even go into the fact that it's also skill-based but also, let's just say the match wasn't green. Then you just you just screwed your pairings completely. Like That's where I say you can lose in pairings versus winning in pairings. Um, if you go in thinking you're getting good matchups and they're really bad, then you probably gave something up for those good quote-unquote matches. And now you're in the, in the shitter because you not only have what you thought was good, but you gave somebody else a bad matchup and now they're all bad. So having a good matrix to start with is probably the most important thing. Like if you can't rate the matrix, it's useless almost to your detriment. Um, yeah, that's the big thing. That being said, it's not just army match. I mean, understanding how the matchup works. I mean, you can get it right, but if you're not good enough to play the matchup, how it's supposed to be, um, that's also a thing that comes down to player skill. And we'll talk about that. Um, and I also think there's different things you can do, right? Like, clearly, I'll tell you something I've noticed. In my personal Warriors of the Dark Gods pairing slash my Matrix, I put a lot of threes. A lot of threes. There's a lot of armies that I'm just like, nah, I can play it. Um, and it's a game. And I, and I do love that about Warriors and that I don't ever, I, I mean, I sometimes feel that this is horrible. But a lot of times, even if it has some shooting or maybe something I don't like, I still can be like, I have the tools to possibly deal with it. Now, I will say one thing about my matchups would be they tend to be very skewy. Um, just because I put a three doesn't mean it's going to be a 10-10. Sometimes I 20 them and sometimes shit goes bad because usually my play style is very all in. Um, and that's not always bad. It's not like I'm risking everything to get a zero. Um, scenario dependent, a lot of times I can go pretty aggressive and guarantee to win or tie the scenario. I rarely lose them. Um, flags might be the hardest one to say that in. Flags is obviously the most risky one to go aggressive in. But even games where I lose big, you, there's moments in the game where I'm like, I had a shot to just 20 this guy. Um, whereas that might not be the case for some armies. I feel like 
some armies like vampires especially seem to have these matchups where they're just like we're gonna dick around and one of us is gonna get a 12 and unless somebody really wants to commit there's not much you can do um and so not every three is the same for example um and not every two is the same sometimes a two is like this is a bad match and i'm definitely not gonna win Sometimes it's bad and I'm going to try to hold on and maybe I'll win. Maybe if he gets too aggressive, I'll win. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things you can put in here. And I've seen people do way different scales, whether it's one to three, one to five with these little evens with downside. Um, I've seen people do like pluses and minuses that kind of indicate variance where like a, you know, all these threes aren't the same where maybe you say, okay, the empire is high variance because I'm going to have to go at him. And if it works, I'm going to just steamroll him. Whereas, I don't know, the dark elves is much less very, I don't know. I'm making, I don't know what it is in this case. So I think that's a big thing as well. Um, but you see that all goes into the matrix and then, then you have the strategy that goes behind it. And one, and so I'm trying to think where I want to go with this. So let's just say the matrix is correct. Um, you know, one thing I like to do to prep, to do a pairing, and I didn't do it here. Did I do it in any of them? I used to do it. But I did in this example. So in this example, you can see that I basically said who we're going to put up first. I don't remember who we put up first. It looks like, it looks like we did ogres. We put up ogres first. So this is how I do a five-man pairing. I'll say we're going to put up ogres first, and then you can pre-plan your entire first round by saying, who do they put up? Who am I going to put against it? So I basically said in this before, I said, I'm going to put up ogres. If they put up sylvan elves, I'm going to put these two against them. If they put up warriors, they put up ID. If they put up dark elves, whatever, dwarves. And then, so I basically had everything planned out until the second round of pairing. Um, how do you maybe say this? You say, okay, well, you know, you might, you might say, okay, I guess this would be shitty. Like ID, if they put ID first, it would be the worst for us because we would only have me and Sil Saurians and we said Saurians weren't that good versus it, but then you might just have to give them away and say, fuck it. Um, you know, how do you pick which army goes up first? Our ogre player, Jesse just put, was it Jesse for this? It was. He just put up threes for everything. So we just threw him up all the time. Um, and I think that this is fine. Like you can do pairing strategies with just pure matrix and not having any thought behind who the players are, what the armies are, you know, just say this number is this number and I'm trying to maximize the number I get out of it. Um, I think that's fair, but I don't think that's the right way to do pairings. And I, one conception or one idea I've heard from people, and I don't actually agree with it is pair for the army. Sorry. I rate the army, not the player. I think that's, fair but i actually don't think that's how you win etc or win quote unquote pairings or do well in pairings because i i feel like player skill 100 percent should matter in how you pair right so i i actually want to dabble into that and not actually into this like how would i you know i would pick this army because it has all threes or i'm gonna you know i will never put the dark elves first because they have two bad matches so i'm gonna put i don't know the ogres first and try to pull out the ID or the Sylvan elves and I, or, or the warriors or the VS, you know, if they put up dwarves, I would never pick dwarves for the ogres because did he get, did he get dwarves? He did. Um, he got warriors. We said, all right, take the warriors because I don't know, whatever reason, get them out of here. I don't know who the dark elves get dwarves. Yeah. Anyway, you know, that whole kind of talking about it, but I don't like this idea that you separate skill from army because you're basically trying to get pairings where you maximize your score, but you don't maximize your score by just getting good army matchups. You maximize your score by getting good player army combinations that beat other player army combination, right? Like that really is, you know, the end thing. So in, in a world where, let's just do a simple, 
I don't know what the best way to do this is. Let's, let me just see if I can do this. Let me just see if I can do something. Sorry, this is kind of on the fly. Let's just say you have an even match, an even match, an advantage match, and a disadvantage, right? So you would say this is pretty even in pairings. And we'll say that it's good for the side. This is like this is rating for this this team, team one. And then this is the opponents, team two, right? So team two says this is their good match, and this is their bad one, right? So let's just let's just take what's the best way to do this thing, right? Like and let's just rank these players like you don't even have to put fear out. Let's just say that the best player is number one, two, three, four, right? And then your one worse there, four, two worse there, your three worse there, two, right? Like, like if this was the the matrix, you might say. Like, this might be really bad for you. Why would you put your worst player against their best player, even if it's a good matchup? And maybe this maybe this kind of goes into where I did have a name Fury in there, right? Why would you why would you pair for your worst player? Because even if, if and assume that these are army ratings, not player ratings. So this is like my army is better than this army. Why would you sacrifice some other matchup? to get your worst player playing their best player in a matchup that is probably favored for you, but you know that their player is better and is probably going to beat you. This is why I don't get the whole pairing for the, like you should really take into account who the players are. And I will say, I will make this claim and this might not be a popular claim, but I think if you took name plates off and everybody played their matchups anonymously and was paired anonymously. So just for the army, I think players, like top players, would score less points at DTC. Not a ton less. I'm not talking they'd go from 100 to, to 50. But I think they would score less. Because I think teams smartly put their bad players against the enemy's best more so. Sometimes teams are like, fuck it, I'll, I'll play Furion with my best player. And just hope, you know, and that's a strategy to beat him. And just say, all right, I think my best player can, can hang with him. And the army matchup is there, and let's do it, right? I think that's potentially can happen. But I don't think it happens as much as people think. I think a lot of people throw their lower players at these top players and say, fuck it, deal with them. We don't care. You're you're bad enough that you're gonna lose to most of the enemy team. Why not just lose to the best guy? Try to hold on, maybe get a couple points, and then we'll beat the rest of his team with our good players. I think that's a valid strategy. I think that's a good strategy. Why sacrifice? You know, depending on where you think the skill is and how the matchup goes and can they actually push for the big win or not, why would you sacrifice your good player into a coin flip? Now, maybe it's not the worst strategy, depending on how your team makeup is, but if Malifo tournaments taught me anything, and Malifo had team events too, and Malifo is much less, like, matchup dependent, in my opinion. The, the common strategy in Malifo tournaments was pair your best player against their weakest player and then have hope your like second or third best players like can beat their second and third best players. And so a lot of times the best players would go crush it, but their team would lose. I would have it happen. Our team, my, my worst player would lose or, you know, I got their third best player and then the two worst players played. And then, you know, whose worst player was, was better than the other worst player, which is also a big deal. So this is where depth kind of comes in, where if you don't have the depth, like it kind of hurts you. But I, I think giving people their give away the best player to the weak play, weak players. Why would you do that? Why would you put Fury on in a bad? You know, do you think you're really going to beat him? Do you think your army matchup is really that good? I wouldn't. I would probably give him the hardest matchup he could, even if it was yellow, and just say fuck it, just try to hold on if you can, and then give somebody else a, an easier, you know, harder match. And I do think that feeds some of the better players' scores um, a little bit. Again, I'm not trying to take away from their high scores, but I definitely believe that they get sometimes easier pairings because people are just, and in a good way, just like, fuck it, I'm not going to. How many times does Cal play Furion at ETC? I don't even know if they ever paired into that. Um, you know what I mean? You rarely, you rarely see these like clash of the, 
best players on either team. Right? Rarely. I mean, it happens sometimes. I think Furian did play Thomas once long ago. But it's rare. Now, Poland has a lot of good players, and that's one reason they're so good. And so, obviously, sometimes you get these matchups where it's, you know, if, if half the team is considered really good or three-quarters of the team is really good, you're going to get these high-skilled players against each other. But if there's only one or two good players per team, or, like, top players, I'm, I'm talking, like, like, everybody's pretty – not everybody. A lot of people are pretty good. But we're talking like these standout players. How many times do they really play each other at ETC? They don't because they don't want to. They want to risk it. Go beat the other, beat the lesser player that you know you're going to beat, um, and then hope your middling players do what they need to do. So this idea that you you should pair just based on army, I don't agree with. I think you have to take into account the players and try to nullify some of the better players. And this is where like matchup knowledge comes in where um what is that other strategy i saw this was the polish strategy i've talked about before where they just pair into like yellows because they just think they're better than everybody and wants to give everybody a chance you know they don't want to skew matchup because i'll give you an example if you give someone a bright green like a very good an or purple in this case like you, in, in essence, nullify some of your skill advantage, right? You can only get 20 points in a game. And so you can think of it as, you know, you're going to get X amount of points. You start at some basis just based on army matchup. It's a 10-10 based on army, and then you say, all right, our player is better. It's going to be a 13-7. But let's say you have an extreme... Let's just say it would be a 14-16 in a yellow, right? Let's just say 14-16, which is 15-5. There, there we go. This is, the, this is the army, and this is the player, right? Well, so your player has a five-point advantage because he's just better. If you give him a, a, a matchup that's a slam dunk that's like a 17-3, and he makes it a 20-0, and this is all theoretical, right? He's, he's actually gaining less points for your team because he he's already set up to win big, so he's just gonna he's only fighting for three extra points in a certain in a, in, in a context, and then at the same time, you know the downside is so much bigger. Whereas if you're if this is a you know a fifteen five matchup, and but the player skill goes the other way, like it's your best player versus their worst. Like, the downside is super high, right? Like, it could be a 0-20. If the other player is good enough, it doesn't really matter how good the matchup is sometimes. You just lose. And that, that goes into how risky it is and stuff like that. So, this is where I kind of go, like, I don't think you should pair for your worst players. I don't, I don't see why. Like, unless you think they can deliver on it. Um, give them games. Don't throw them to the wolves. I hate that attitude, too. The idea that, Give me a red, and I'm gonna get you five points instead of three. I'm like, what the f who fuck? Don't that doesn't matter. Um, I also think you know, next man up, or if it's your time to shine, like you should, you can you can pair for your your best players, but at the same time, like your your number five, six, seven, eights need to do their job as well. If you do get them to a good pairing, let's just say you do, and it may be a good pairing versus a, an average opponent. Like we talked about the extremes of like fearing and stuff but there's also these players who are pretty you know they still have to perform on their good matchups and depending on you know should you pair for that again i i can't imagine like you have to take into account player skill right like i can't fathom this idea that you wouldn't want to at least account for it a little bit you know if you had two threes right this is how you'd want to do it i don't even know I, I actually don't know the optimal strategy but you'd have to want to take into account skill you'd have to say that in an even matchup if the player matchup was very bad it would probably go bad so don't pair into it don't think of it as a green it should be a bad matchup and if you have listen if you think if you play thomas in germany and you think he's gonna beat everybody on your team just fucking give him the worst player you can or the worst army on your team and say, all right, you go hang with him. Let us try to beat the other guys. 
Because you might say, okay, our other guys, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's just say Thomas beats everybody on the USA team. And let's say that I probably lose the least points to him, which isn't actually true because I play super aggressive, so I tend to go down big or I beat him. Um, but why would I, like, if I get a seven and my worst player gets a, a three because he can play conservatively, why would we put me against him? Why not just give him the worst player, give, like, give 17, put me against whoever else on their team that I think I can beat, and let me go beat him, right? So... I don't know. Do do other teams do this? I don't know. They have to take into account skill a little bit, right? When you're pairing, especially if you know the players. Now, to be fair, before all these online events, and before you know it became popular for all of us to play each other, you wouldn't know exactly how good everybody is. Um, you might, you know, and really, it should be semi-agnostic in a sense that. Like you have to, you have to have confidence. Like you should have confidence that you can beat most people. Like if anything, the online events have shown me I am way less scared of other countries than I was in the beginning. And this is not a knock on other countries' skill. It's kind of like just showing you that like every, they're all humans that play this the same game we all do. They know some more, some of them are better with tricks. Some of them have cooler, you know, maybe better armies. Um, but there's not, they're not doing anything that is so crazy that you're like, I can't fathom doing it or beating them. And so I actually think that you can get to such a status in the Warhammer community that people fold to you before you even played the game. This kind of goes into that whole idea of, Pairing versus the pair your shit players versus the best players just expecting to lose. But I also think some people have the mentality of, oh my God, I'm going against Cal. I cannot win. I'm just I'm just dead in the water. I might as well lose and roll over, right? Why would you think that? Like, if you think you're a pretty good player, like you should be able to beat them or have a chance against them. And maybe they outplay you and beat you, and that's fine. But going into this idea that you're going to lose and then trying to prevent it, like I hate that. I don't like that personality trait. I think that's dumb. Um, and I think people get points because of it. I think people just fold before the game even starts. Where I said, if names were played without nameplates, I think people would perform better against better players because they wouldn't have this notion of, oh my God, he's so much better than me, I can't win. Um, I mean, I think there's times where people make dumb moves, good players, and then... They're not actually taking advantage of because the opponent is like, he's good. There has to be a trap. There has to be some reason he's doing that. Um, and there isn't. It just was a mistake, right? That they didn't catch. So, yeah. I do think you need to be, have the confidence that you can beat people. This isn't chess where, like, a higher-rated player rarely loses to a much lower-rated player. There's dice involved. There's chances you can take. There's little things you can miss, just like in chess, where somebody can miss something. Um, but you kind of need to be able to believe you can do it. This is where I also think army matches, army composition um, matters a bit. Like, I was thinking about this today, where I, and I've talked about this if you watch my Warriors video, I play a style that is just like, I hate sitting back. I hate people who like sit in corners. And I talk shit about them. I talk shit about shooting. I talk shit about people who just sit there and get sh shoot you. And I still don't like it. But at the same time, I understand why a lot of really good players play armies that have both magic, shooting, and combat and movement all into one, right? Why is the Furion Scrub High Elves so popular? You know, it had three flyers to control movement, it had really, really, really strong shooting. It had solid magic, and the healing helped with any spikes of maybe damage and kind of get your, yourself back. And it could kind of play that cagey, I have three bolt throwers and a bunch of sea guard. I can throw some magic missiles at you, and I can zone you with flyers who have, you know, and a lot of points into like one or two units, right? I'm not saying it was easy to play it. I'm saying that it was, in a sense, past, it, it had the skills to like sit there, a lot of people were scared to run at it. 
though in talking to some of those players, sometimes the fear was that people weren't at you. So I think that's kind of came with being some of the top players was you had that respect of like, one, you had to run at them and actually know what you were doing. So if you did it wrong, they had the tools to crush you. Um, the same with like the Conrad Empire list. When played really well, that list had a lot of shooting. It had good, efficient magic with the Cosmo guy. And then it had enough combat to make you respect it when the, in the, you know, the Stank and the Inquisitors and the Night Bus and the Imperial Guard, but not so much that it's like, it's all they had. They could easily, you know, could kind of reach out and touch you, but at the same time, it forced you to come at you. And I think that actually that's something Cole and Liss do annoyingly well, and I hate it because I think it's kind of boring a little bit where they give you just enough magic and shooting to be like, you fucking obnoxious piece of shit. And then enough combat to like, they don't go all in to where they lose if you make it to them. Like they can outplay you from there. And I personally, it, I don't love it. Like in my head, I know it's good. I know it's good. I just don't like doing it. But I do think that that is a style of, you know, I do think good players do that. Cause I think, Cal and his beast herd list, I think he get, he was a very good player, but I think that list was also so powerful and could be so aggressive because it was so fast. And so I don't know how many, if it had really bad matchups, I didn't play much back in the day at the moment, but with ambushing speed, Druidism to heal. Yes, he didn't have armor, but he had healable Gortox and really tanky chariot guys. I don't know if it had such bad matchups, but it could also probably weather it a bit because of the healing to where, he might be the, I mean, he might be my idol in that case because he just took a balls to the walls list and crushed people across the board. Um, I'm sure they paired for him a little bit because why wouldn't you pair for him a bit? But, um, you know, I do, you, you very rarely see, and maybe I'm just, maybe I'm wrong. I, I tend not to see like these super, I don't know, they always have some safeness to them. And that's probably good because you can kind of counter like, like I see it in my own games where I'm kind of putting myself out there in my play style where even if I think I'm much better than the other person, I still play in a way or have to play in a way the way that I play my army to where I give them a chance to win through shooting me down or like just having low wound counts on my units and not having a lot of range because I don't take a ton of ma like I don't take a ton of magic and a hell many shooting warriors. You know, back in the day it was like warriors was mainly about like portals, teleporting, strong scoring, and then like Veilwalker mages blowing up things if needed. And you know, people didn't take Feldrake Elders. And then but then they were it was one of the stronger things they did and they got the good matchups and they went and did it. Um and I'm super risky, so I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to sit here and claim that I'm better than everybody because I take risks. But I do think, I think about it sometimes where I'm like, if I just, what if I just played a list that, and I did it with orcs too, I hated sitting back. What if I just sat back and had this combined arms army that kind of shot just enough to make people come in? Because, I mean, every game I play, I'm like, I'm the one that's like across the board, right? But if you know that I'm going to do it, if you know that I'm going to do it and you know that I kind of have to do it, like, because I feel like what happens a lot is people are either, and it's, it happens because I have a full combat army. So people will talk, you know, I'm talking shit about shooting, but you're right. My army, I spend thousands of points on combat. And so I pretty much have the choice to say, I'm either going to go at you or I'm not. And if I don't, you basically have no course to do anything. You can't get across the board at me, you know. If I play a movement three ID army and they deploy like in a corner and I just run to the other corner, turn one, there's nothing they can do. They're too slow to get to me. And I just say, fuck it. Put my middle finger up. Fuck you. Um, but some of these better armies, not better armies, but some of these armies that other players take, like the Thurian scrub list, the Conrad Empire, it kind of had this nice like, well, I have the range magic. I can kind of sit here. And do the shit, and I'll shoot you, just as you shoot me. And if you come in, I'll, I'll play you. And if the opportunity presented itself, this is where I think they kind of not only separated themselves from 
other lists of the similar type, but probably other players is when you did come in or they needed to go, they played their aggressive elements very well and could go and get big wins. Like the Phoenix and the Griffins and even the Seaguard unit. Like it's very different watching somebody who copied the list and plays like a bitch and then somebody who knows how to play the list and is given the opportunity to be a man, they can still go and get points. It's it's it, it was, you know, Conrad Empire was a big example. Um, I watched him play it a couple of times and I've watched people play it because a lot of people copied it for a while. And you could just see this. The people who copied it for a while were very defensive with it to the point of like, Bleh. like they were fine and it shot him up a lot and did it, but he never like the aggressiveness to like go and like make plays wasn't as there. And I think he, when he played it, he did a lot more cooler. Nothing like, nothing like, oh my God, how did he ever do it? But like he had the willingness to go and make the plays. So I think playmakers on armies like that actually do very well at ETC because you have enough firepower to force people on you. But then when they get there, you have enough things to do to combat it. Uh, the same can be said for, you know, all shooting armies. You know, they say, you know, put your shitty players on dwarves or something and just shoot people and hope they survive. And I guess to the other extent, aggro armies, depending on the aggro army, you could say, you know, what am I trying to think of? I know we've we've kind of gone down a tangent. I'm going to end this video soon because I don't want a, an hour video and I know it's been rambling. You know, if you have a solid all-around army, you know, I feel like a good player can take advantage against any type of list and any type of play style. I think when you have a very shooty army, you are very limited in what you can do in any matchup because I feel like you're depending on the other person to kind of play your game. And so you could have your best player in the world and he's playing shooty dwarves and he's just like, well, my life sucks because the enemy chose not to fight me. But at the same time, if they came to fight you, you really don't get, need to use all your skill to win that. And then I think there's the opposite end where you have like super aggressive armies where again, I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying they take the most skill, but I'm saying like, if you have to be the aggressor, you have to do it right. But you're also putting yourself at a risk of because you have less control a little bit because you are so aggressive and you maybe maybe a single model spam where you only have a couple wounds, like your dragon could just get one shot by a cannon. And there's no skill really involved in that, so it's a risk. Um, like you as the dragon player or as the offensive player, it, it, at some point it doesn't matter how much better you are than the enemy if the matchup is a certain way, if they just like kill you, right? You're, if your whole strategy is like, I hope they don't shoot me to death, um, like that sucks too. And now you can say, okay, if you're really good and you play other aggressive armies and like in this middle ground, your skill will outdo it. Or you're so good at being aggressive, like with the cow list, he was so good at it. That it didn't matter how defensive the person was, you were just going to fuck him up most of the time. Maybe there are lists out there like that. I do think some of the most more aggressive lists um, have gotten riskier because they've gone up in points. If you think of demons and, and warriors, they've, even breeze herds to an extent, they've gone up in points. Um, you know, single models have gone up in points, healing for druidism went down, like you're risking a lot more, like it's almost safer to play the other way. I don't know where I'm going with that. I just think sometimes I think like that middle ground of like, I'm going to be just shooty enough to be annoying, you know, is the better way to play. But it's also like the boring, -er, I guess, but that's the nature of ninth, right? Like ninth. I've said it in the Discord and stuff. It takes two to tango. If you get a corner Charlie, you have... There's only... so Like, in, in chess, if the other person is being very defensive, if you're much better than them, like, you can't just tie a game versus Magnus because you want to be defensive. Um, whereas, I feel like if somebody says, I don't want to play the game... And the other person, depending on their tools, says, I want to play the game. Like you might just be, a, you might be sacrificing some of your skill advantage because of that. Or you just can't do anything because they just decide to sit in the corner. 
right? In flags or something. Or they say, fuck it, I'm going to give up the scenario. I'm going to sit in this corner. You can either risk it or you can take your 13 and be happy. And they just fuck you from that. Doesn't always happen. Some armies can just can't open the other person. Um, and sometimes going in just causes you to lose because they now have the advantage because you've spent all your time going to them and then they just shoot back at you or something like that. So um, I do... That is probably the most frustrating thing that I find about Ninth Age in any war game. It wasn't that different in Malifaux. I guess it was. It was because of the way the objectives worked. In, uh, like, yes, winning scenario in Warhammer is, woo, you get three points and that's really big. In Malifaux, you just won the game. Like, if you didn't win the objective, you you lost. So you could play to just win the game without really always interacting with your opponent. And they would just lose. And there was no, like, 0 to 10 versus 5 to 8. It wasn't really a thing. It was just win-loss for the most part. Spread kind of mattered, but not really. Um, and so because winning 4 to 3 was the same as winning 10 to 0 for the most part, all you had to do was play to win the scenario and it would be you would be thumbs up, you'd win and move on to the next game. Um, whereas I think in ninth, people are scared, people don't want to lose big, people play like bitches when they want their seven points and their hand job for getting seven. And it can just make for like super boring games. I mean, I'm sure most ETC games are not the most exciting to watch with like two people like creeping up on each other from the corners, potentially shooting each other, playing magic, something dies, maybe something happens. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to combat that other than just playing super aggressive. If there's an army that just does it really well, maybe KOE does it well, or if it's just, or is it just, do you have to play that kind of game? Do you have to be willing to play like this shooty, mixed arms where you're just shooty enough to be annoying but then when they come get you you know you can do stuff back i don't know I, it's like the italians play super aggressive all the time it seems like they don't even take super shooty armies um but if your whole meta does that then it's different right whereas if you look at the i mean polish masters event that just took place it looked like every other army if not every other army, most armies were like this boring ass shooty shit defensive style like whatever like empire was like the most played army it's like empire and bullshit like that like you it wasn't a ton of like super aggressive lists it looked like maybe cruise was the most aggressive um i guess maybe it's a style thing who knows anyway that's my randomness about pairings and so i don't even i didn't even go into pairing strategy maybe another day i'll talk about it but again i guess my overview would be I don't even have a review. Take it for what you will. Thanks.